There we go. Holy be thy name, right? So we got to regard the Lord as holy to come near to his presence to press in, okay? Pressing in means to draw near to to God, but we can't get it twisted. You need to understand that God is already near to us. He's always with us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. He's with us always, even when we can't feel his presence or his spirit, and we feel totally forsaken and crushed. God is still with you, even until the end of the world, it says in Matthew 28. So what, what pressing in is, is when, when we sort of come into a line with God. Right. We're taking that time. It means for us to draw close to enjoy his fellowship and his presence. So when you take the time in your walk and your your time of day where you take that time to enjoy his fellowship and communing with him and his presence, you are pressing into him. OK, the definition of the word press means to choose to push to get closer to someone or something. So we choose, and we're going to talk about time here, because time is a huge issue uh, when it comes to pressing in, right? Like, dude, I seriously feel like the days are getting shorter every day, because there's not enough time in the day to do the things that we got to do. And then somehow we got to make time for God to press into him too, right? Because if we don't do that, that devil comes lurking in your mind, and those fiery darts come and it gets easier to sin because it's been weeks since you've pressed into the Lord, right? So we got to make this a habit, man. Let's start out and look at some examples of pressing in. Uh, let's go to Mark chapter 2. Craig, you got the uh, King James Version? Uh, I've actually got the new king in front oh, cool. of me, right? Hey, Jack, um, you got, you got it, the King James? Uh, not, not in front of us. Uh, no, I got G, one. Got, yeah, I got it. I got it. All right, cool, cool. So can somebody read the, the King James Version, Mark chapter 2, verse 1 through 4? I got it. Cool, man. And again, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. And straightway, many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. All right. I like the King James, particularly on that verse, because it uses the word press, talking about the multitudes thronging Jesus. Now, look at the men, the friends of the paralytic, right? They knew Jesus could heal this dude, but there was like hundreds of people crowding Jesus. These guys couldn't get close to Jesus. So what did they do? His friends loved them so much, they ripped the roof off the joint and lowered them down into the feet of Jesus, and the man was healed, right? He pressed into the Lord and received his healing because of it. He, like, took it by force. He could have just, like, shrugged his shoulders and walked away and be like, oh, I'll get it next time, right? But no, they took that roof off, bro. They made way, and they took that opportunity. They seized that moment, and that's how we need to treat uh, our time pressing into the Lord. Because you're never going to have time, bro. We have to seize it by force. We have to make time, bro. Because the devil's going to set it up that you never, like, you're going you're gonna to make a, a conscious effort and say, you know what? Tomorrow at 2 to 2.30, I'm going to press into the Lord. And I guarantee you, you're going to get smoked at, like, 1.30 to 3 o'clock, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to take the moments by force and make, forcefully make time to press into the Lord. We got to keep that in mind. You know, if you got a lunch break at work. 
go out in your car, pray, pray in the spirit or whatever. But you got to take that and make that time. Let's look at another who example. Was, uh, like uh, just to chime in on that. Who is I? I don't know the story. I just heard it at Pastor Paul's uh, service the one time. He was talking about a guy who climbed a tree and the way that Jesus <laughs> was passing by. The tax collector. Zacchaeus. Yeah. 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 yeah Zacchaeus climbed the tree and made way to, so that he could get to the Lord and invited him to his uh, house for dinner. That's a good example, John. Um, let's check out one in Luke 7. And Craig, you want to read that one? Luke 7, 43 through 48. Yeah, that was uh, Luke 7, uh, 43 through 48. Yes, sir. All right. Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most, and he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seeth thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she had washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore, I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loveth much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. Amen. So that woman who was a sinner gets in the presence of Jesus and falls prostrate before him, right? Washes his feet, anoints his feet. And it's a good example and a reminder of what it is to press into the Lord. And also I was looking to, and I, I wrote down the scripture wrong. Remember the woman who had a blood flow for 12 years in the in the Gospels? And it says that she just touched the hem of Jesus's garment and was healed, right? So in both these scriptures, we see an example of two women that are forcefully pressing into the presence of the Lord, right? They're, they're forcefully receiving their healing and forgiveness of sins that Jesus offers them. And it's a good example of how we need to be with pressing in, okay? We need to understand that we don't have to do anything to get God to move on our behalf because there's a wrong frame of mind on this teaching that that it's like um um like a what's the word I'm looking for like like you can earn favor in the in the sight of God by pressing in, right? But that's not true either, okay? It's good for us and it's good to be in his presence and it feeds our spirit and our spirit man grows and we get strong in the spirit. But you can't like earn favor doing it. So a lot of people come at it with like um, a selfish sort of mentality, right? We we can't be serving or doing anything with God for gifts because then our heart motive's a little. We got to check our heart motive. We got to come by grace through faith, right? And that's it, man. Not of works, least any man should boast. It says. So uh, everything that we will ever need was accomplished. At the finished work of Calvary, the death and resurrection of Jesus, it's finished. Okay, we don't need anything more. We have all the tools that we need for this walk. When we press into him, we enjoy his fellowship and his presence. And, and you know why I was thinking about this? Why do we enjoy his fellowship and his presence? Dude, I don't know about you guys, but it's like something was deposited inside of me at birth. And I didn't understand it. And for years, I, I did drugs and alcohol and women and fighting to try to just like fill this void in my heart or like a scratch that I couldn't scratch. And the more I did that stuff, the more it itched, right? But then when I found Jesus, it like resonated. It's almost, and I, I'm trying to like, I don't even know how to say this, but I feel like all of us, we're all called in him and he deposited something into our spirit before the foundation of the universe. And when you realize who you are in him and who he is in you, it's like that thing that he deposited in you is finally being fulfilled. It's like it's been in you this whole time. You couldn't figure it out your whole life, but it's been like a gnawing presence. And then when you press into him 
It brings like fulfillment. Like, you know, your purpose in life, you know why you had to suffer all that pain and suffering. It was for a reason and for a purpose to make you the man of God that you are today or why those relationships had to go so bad. Right. But it, but it forges you into what you are now. It's like, I, I think it's like he deposits something in us. And when we press in, it connects that thing. You know what I mean? You guys got any thoughts on that? Because I don't, I know I'm not saying it right. What I'm trying to say here. What do you guys think? Yeah, I got a thought on this. Uh, good teaching, Matthew. I think that uh, we live in a soft, easy culture, America, compared to the rest of the nations, a lot of nations. And I think that uh, those that fight the hardest, you know, like Paul, like David, will receive the most honor and glory. That's uh, that's my thinking. Amen. G Amen. Yeah, G, what do you think on this one too, bro? Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree with you. I, I agree with both you guys. Um, I, I felt that too, that, you know, it was always whatever. It's like the faith of the mustard seed. That's what comes to mind. Like there's, there's this, this tiny little grain of faith that he puts in all of us. And before we come here, we know who we are before we come here, but being in this life kind of gives us amnesia. So we walk through this life as sinners because we are born into sin and death and we're constantly battling the flesh. We're constantly battling uh, demons from, you know, attacking us from the outside in and, and whatnot. And, you know, they get a hold into people and, you know, that's the whole deliverance thing. But as who we were before we came to the Lord, there is always that hole that is missing in everybody until they come to the Lord. And once we know him, it's like he, the, the way he revealed it to me when I got saved was everything that I will ever know. He literally opened my eyes to it that night when I got saved. But even now today, I'm, I'm relearning what he showed me that night in that flash of that evening into the morning. You know what I mean? It's like the, the, the tree is growing, you know what I mean? And the more that we do learn who we are in the Lord, we're able to fulfill that. And we are in a, in a society in America where it is easy. We don't really even understand real poverty here. There's EBT cards, you know what I'm saying? Like, but that's, that's a whole other thing. But yeah, I, I, I do believe that we have everything we need in us when we're born because he did know us from the foundation of the world so we were always his we were always his we just had to realize that because we have this thing called free will and uh working for the devil is not fulfilling at all because that leads to sin and death it is sin and it leads to death and he le jesus christ leads to life he is life yeah well said bro amen the last Man. point I wanted to make, I think that, uh, you know, comfort zones are so comfortable and we really don't want to get out, get out of them. But to, uh, you know, fight for God's kingdom, I think it's pretty tough to get people out of comfort zones. It's easy to play church. Anybody can play church, but to get out of your you to force yourself out. My thoughts. It's good, Arnie. Yeah. Amen. All right, let's jump now to Matthew chapter 25. We're going to look, we're going to look at a revelation. All right. And this is in comparison to time because time is money and time is important, right? Time is everything. And like, dude, we all start dying the minute we're born, right? So time is against you your entire life, bro. We're all in this world of sin and death. I want to look at a parable Jesus gives us about this. And we're going to look at Matthew chapter 25. And I'm coming at this from a different angle. There's, you know, seven ways and seven revelations of each scripture. This is just one of those ways that the Holy Spirit sort of showed me. So I want to look at the parable of the virgins. Uh, Jack, can you read uh, Matthew 25, verse 1 to 13? Yeah, you got it. <clears throat> then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamp and lamps and went out to meet the groom. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they did not take extra oil with them. But the prudent ones took oil in flasks with their lamps. Now, while the groom was delaying, 
they all became drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight, there finally was a shout. Behold the groom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins got up and trimmed their lamps. But the foolish virgins said to the prudent ones, give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. However, the prudent ones answered, no, there most certainly would not be enough for us. And you too, go instead to meet uh, the merchants and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the groom came in and those who were ready went into him, in with him to the wedding feast and the door was shut. Yet later, the other virgins came out saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Be on alert then, because you do not know the day nor the hour. Amen. Now I want to look at this from a different angle. We have 10 virgins, five foolish, five wise. Now all 10 of them have lamps, right? We know in Psalm 119, it says, thy word, O Lord, is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. So picture this. We have 10 Christians. All 10 of these Christians have Bibles. The lamp is likened to the word of God, right? But only five of these Christians have oil and five do not have oil, okay? Oil is the time that you spend with God in this lifetime. Oil is that pressing in to God. It's that spiritual relationship that you can only have with Jesus Christ, okay? That's what the oil is. That's why they told the five wise told the foolish, "Go, we can't sell it to you. Go and buy your own. How do you buy oil? You spend time with God. What did I say? Time is money, right? And the time that we spend with God pressing into him, that's eternal, bro. That's the oil. That's what the foolish virgins are lacking is that time. Not just in the word. I'm not just talking about reading your Bible. I'm talking about that time that you press into his presence. You spend time with them. You're repenting of your sin. You open your heart and cry to the Lord and repent for the way that you lived your life before, right? Because he's, he's changing you and molding you. That's that precious oil. That's the time, bro. That's what we need to be mindful of. When I was studying this today, because this time for us, I'm going to give you three examples of how to apply your time. You apply your time through the word. You apply your time uh, listening to the word, reading the word. You apply your time in two-way prayer. You talk to God, and then you shut up. You let God talk to you. Everybody wants to talk to God, but nobody wants to listen to God. And then the third way you apply your time is worship. Singing music to God or listening to godly music that edifies your spirit. These are good ways to press in. These are healthy ways for us to press in. You know what I'm saying? And I was thinking of an analogy of how I could convey this, right? When I was locked up, bro, everybody like Insta coffee. Like I've seen people get murdered over Insta coffee. It's no joke, okay? <laughs> but just because it's instant doesn't mean that it's good. It tastes horrible. I can't stand this stuff. But there's nothing like a slow brewed, nice roast coffee in the morning. You know what I'm saying? It's that extra time for the quality. And that's what God's looking for. Or like tea, right? You could have quick tea, bro, and just smash some packets and be good. Or you could take your time, put tea bags and lemon in the sun and let it cook all day and have a delicious tea, right? It's the same way with our walk with Jesus. Yeah, you could pray two minutes real quick on your way out the door and maybe read a scripture too, or you could take the time to press into the Lord, right? To, to spend time in his presence and fellowshipping and communion with him. And that's what we're looking for. That's what pressing in is. Amen? Amen. Good point, Matthew. I thought that, uh, you know, black oil, diamonds, gold and silver were important, but uh Time, nobody, absolutely nobody back buys back time. So uh, it is important. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely something, Arnie, that you've taught me over the years, bro. Like Arnie has got, he's been working with me for like seven years now. And that's something that he's definitely ingrained into me in evangelism is, dude, time is very important, right? But more than that, the time we spend with the Lord is everything, dude. All right. Let's look at our key text now. I said all that to build up to this. Let's look at Luke 16, 16, the words of Jesus Christ. Uh, 
Um, John, you want to read that, bro? 16, Luke 16, 16. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached, and everyone is pressing, and everyone is pressing in, in it. And it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one of the little ones. One of the law. Can I start over? I'm sorry. I yeah, yeah. Hey, just read just verse 16 real quick. I got poor lighting. The law of the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God, God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. Everyone is pressing into it. Now let's get context. John, could you read uh, uh, 14 to 18? So we have context to what Jesus is talking about. 14 what? Oh, 14, 14 to 18. 14 to 18. Now the Pharisees who were lovers of money also heard of these things and they derided him. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is for what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of the Lord. The law and the prophets were until John. Since the time, since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached, and everyone is pressing into it. And it was easier for heaven and earth to pass away, for one tittle of the law to fail. Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. All right, so let's look at that. Now we're going to observe what Jesus is referencing in context. So we see that Jesus is addressing the Pharisees. So first, right out the gate, right? The Pharisees thought that observance to the law was righteous, okay? They failed to realize the entire law, the point of the law and the prophets was pointing to Jesus Christ as the Messiah, okay? They think by their own works, their own Torah observance, that they're righteous in God's sight, and, dude, we all fall for this when we first get saved, right? We get into that legalistic mind frame. We have that religious spirit. We think that we're holy and nobody else is, right? We've all fallen for that trap. And, and a, lot of, a lot of us do, man. I was one of them that fell for that, right? But we need to realize that all of the law and all of the prophets point us to Jesus, bro. And Jesus lays it out right out the gate, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. He said he's giving us the new instruction of the covenant, right? Where the law said, don't murder. Now Jesus is like, don't even think about murder. And that's so difficult. We can't do that unless Jesus helps us, right? The law says, don't sleep with your neighbor's wife. Now Jesus says, don't even think about sleeping with your neighbor's wife. And there ain't no way you as a man going to overcome that unless the Holy Spirit's doing it with you and you're walking right. And it's impossible. Okay. Um, so the way of justification is no longer valid since notice in 1616, he mentions John by name because John came announcing that now belief and repentance were the means of entrance into the kingdom of God. This is before Jesus dies on the cross and resurrects. So the Pharisees have the law and the prophets, and this is what Jesus is addressing. But John the Baptist says no more. Believe in the Lord and repent of your sins, right? And you'll be saved. And that's what this scripture is referencing. And then the whole thing with divorce, I was really chewing on that for a minute. And, you know, what the Lord showed me was that um, the Pharisees, okay, the Pharisees to force their way into the kingdom of God, they needed to humble themselves and divorce their love of money, not their wives. Okay. Because these guys were just dropping their wives. And Jesus is like, you're not even seeing the point. You guys have greed in your hearts and a love of money that you're married to, and you're divorce, divorcing your wives. These things should not be. You know what I mean? So that's what he was addressing with that divorce issue. There's a whole study we could do on divorce and marriage. That's a whole other topic. I like how Jesus sort of correlated that into his rebuke, though, of that religion. Um, so, yeah. So the main portion, though, 1616 being... That the, uh, the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it, okay? And this correlates with another scripture exactly like this in Matthew. Some of you guys are familiar with this. Let's go to Matthew eleven twelve. Matthew eleven twelve. Andy, could you read that one for us, bro? Matthew eleven twelve. Yeah, I got it here. Matthew 
And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. The violent take it by force. There it is again. Okay? So when it comes to you, brother, pressing into the word of God, the world's going to stop you. Your flesh is going to stop you. The devil's going to stop you. You're going to stop yourself. Right? All of these things are going to try to stop you from pressing in. But you need to bear that ninth fruit. Remember the nine fruits that we've studied so many times in Galatians? The ninth fruit is self-control or self-discipline. So we have to use self-discipline or self-control to force ourselves to take it by force and press in to the kingdom of God, right? We have to take that initiative and do that. Um, does anybody want to add to that? That'd be like taking up your cross. Like you want to watch YouTube or, you know, go to the kayak or whatever you want to do, but you kind of sacrifice that to press in. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, just like we talked about last week, crucifying your flesh, taking up your cross and denying yourself. Right. And I was just thinking that, uh, you know, brothers, it's uh, hard to stay humble in this culture. And uh, the other thing I was thinking, you know, sometimes I think the devil's my worst enemy. And sometimes I look in the mirror and uh, it's me, right? Mm -hmm. Good point, Arnie. Yeah. I think yes, uh, Galatians 2.20 is a good uh, backup for, for what we just read. Um, I'll read it real quick. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I think we need to always remember this when we're having hard times in our walks and every day is not a bed of roses. We're stepping on thorns and we need to remember that, you know. Christ was a man of sorrows. We, you know, we're going to experience some of that to truly have fellowship with him. We're going to experience a lot of that in life and, and in our walks and ministries and whatnot. So I think we need to, uh, you know, realize that and really crucify it, crucify the flesh, because it will always jump up. It will always rise up. And we got to remember what price we were bought with and the fact that we do have to press in to spend that time with the Lord to get balanced, to get rebalanced, you know, when we get a flat tire. <laughs> yeah, I think that crucifying the flesh and pressing in go hand in hand. You know, I'm glad you're bringing this up too, bro, because um, there's some, you know, you know, I'm not even going to say the name, but somebody was doing a teaching online about how we don't have to crucify the flesh. Everything's a demon. Oh yeah. Uh, when it comes yeah. to lust, it's a demon. When it comes to cigarettes, it's a demon. Everything's a demon. And bro, demonic realm is real. Okay. It's, it's very real. A lot of people don't understand. But what I can't stand is when Christians try to hyper spiritualize every little thing. Cause dude, Jesus is very clear. He says that we're going to have to pick up our cross and follow him. He says that we will have to deny ourselves. So I, I just want to bring up and remind us, dude, that not everything's a demon. When you drop the ball and you don't crucify your flesh, right? Let's say with like porn or something, right? And you open that door. Now you're starting to open the realm up to the demonic. And the more right. that you do that, the bigger that door gets. And you can bring in a demon, but it didn't start with a demon. It started with you not being able to crucify your flesh and deny yourself. We need to understand that, bro, and stop spiritualizing every little tiny thing. You know what I mean? Amen. Yeah. Anybody got a, anything to add to that? Good point. How many Christians, when they get a bad battery, they blame the devil and the battery is like five or six years old, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we got to have a little common sense. Absolutely, Arnie. Common sense goes a long way, right? <laughs> Amen. All right. Let's look at how uh, King David. <clears throat> yeah. The uh, scripture that I thought of and uh, was um, Jesus saying, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And any kind of, you know, big 
thing that you're saying on top of that. I don't know the exact scripture, but he's saying anything else is from the evil one, which mm. makes I kind of wonder about that. Like uh, if you say you're going to do something and you just say yes and you do it, you don't, you know, try to proclaim this big thing. It's just like you just Absolutely. have to do it. Yeah, God's gonna hold God holds us very accountable to our words, right? Jesus, Jesus holds us so accountable we don't even realize it in this flesh. He says in Matthew 18, by your words will you be justified, and by your words will you be condemned, right? Um I like Gary Wayne a lot, and he talks about the mystery of religion and the occult, and um, you know, in witchcraft, they make these covens, these word oaths to these fallen angels. And then they come out of it and they get saved. And the power of Christ that breaks that 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 word covenant. Like if we were to see into the spiritual realm, the weight and depth of the power of our words, it would totally blow our mind. But we can't really see it because we're sort of veiled by this flesh in a realm of sin and death. You know what I mean? But the occult knows this stuff. That's why the first thing they get people to do in the occult is to start making like look at Freemasonry, right? They start making packs and covenants. And if you look at the Freemason oaths right out the gate, like first, second, third degree level masonry, you have to say that if you tell the secrets of their um, of their mystery religion, then death will be upon your family. Right. Like horrible death, like right out the gate. Why would that be? That's because what Satan's trying to get that that word coven over him. But what you're Charlie, that scripture you bring up. That's why Jesus tells us, just let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything more is from the evil one. It's a good point, yeah. Charlie. Because because that scripture actually goes on to say, don't make oaths and don't swear by this and swear by that. It, it continues to say those, you know, to say those things as uh, as you go on. Also in Freemasonry, one of the one of the first initiations they make them do is say that the person, the initiate is in darkness and mm. they solicit people that are monotheistic. So they want Christians. They want Islamists, they, Muslims. They want people that are Jews. That's what they want initially. And then to make them, per, them say that they are in darkness. No, any Christian that takes that initiation is literally making a covenant now, denying the light of Jesus Christ, saying that they're in darkness, and now they're under the law of Freemasonry. See how easy it works? Hey, G, could I ask you a question, bro? Yeah. I don't, I'm not, I'm totally ignorant on this. Does the mafia do that with the vows yes. and the oath? Yes. They do that yes. too? It's, it's a blood oath. There's a blood oath to uh, the the finger is, is, is pricked with me. It was cut with a knife. And um, we're made to actually swear and bleed blood on a Catholic saint, stating that if we, you know, basically divulge or, or tell any secrets of the mafia that, that our soul will burn in hell like the saint is burning, uh, we're supposed to put the uh, mafia above our families, our, our wives, our children, and things like that. These are things that they make that they make people say when they join. And um, yeah. Yeah, it's it's a blood covenant. Yeah, so the mafia. Yeah, yeah, like gangster yeah. Italian mafia. Yes. Whoa. Yeah. yeah, you should check out G's testimony. But yeah, due to sotuism, they make you take a knife and run it across your whole hand to blood in. You know what I mean? Yeah. But praise well, the well, Lord well, for the freedom in Jesus well, Christ, bro, that He well, frees us from that. Amen. Amen. Go ahead, Arnie. I wanted to. I wanted to tack on to what Charlie was saying. I didn't uh, go to college, but I did go to trade school, had a wife and a couple of kids at the time. So I had to borrow money. Right. Uh, but I paid back my loans because that was my name and that was my honor that was involved. Now, people go to college today. They don't they don't value their name and their honor. They don't feel like they have to pay their loans back. But I did so. Just want you men to know that. <laughs> Amen, Arnie. Amen. Hey, uh, can you guys hear me at all? Yeah. Yeah, Mike. Oh, come on. I wasn't sure if my headphones were acting up. But, uh, but yeah, that's why our vows are so so important. Like, if you say, say a vow, you, like God will require it of us. So it's not a light matter. You know what I mean? 
So say vows. Mm -hmm. Any vow, vowing for anything. Marriage vows. Vowing not to ever do drugs or drink ever again and then going back to it, stuff like that. God will require it of us. Just as an example. It's just like it's like a stronger uh, promise. How about how everybody says swear to God about everything? It's just blind. Mm -hmm. And every uh, you know, ten year old girls run around going, I swear to God, I swear to God, I swear to God. You know, everybody's making these swears to God and not thinking anything. About it. Yep. Yeah, good exactly. point. It tells us not to swear yeah. about anything in heaven, right? Yes. And that would yeah. be him. Yes. So I cut that that out because I used to say that a lot. It could it I could also be uh, to to lesser beings like angels and and people that are into witchcraft and stuff like that. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it gets crazier. The higher and darker you get up the totem pole, the worse it gets. Like you can listen to Bill Schnoblin's testimony when he crossed that level. He was already like 33 degree level Freemason. I think he made it up to like level 90 or whatever. I don't even know how high I forget. But with his initiation process, he had to drink the blood supposedly of a fallen angel and the fallen angel drank his blood. And once this transaction took place, he started to crave human blood and he would get sick without it. He would literally drink human blood to stay well until uh, he was stripped of his power. So, I mean, it just keeps going darker and darker. That's why the Lord tells us, don't do this. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Just abstain from everything else because you're going to muddy up the works, right? And if you have made a vow or a covenant or a pact or you falsely sweared, praise God for 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5 that says if any man be in Christ he is a new creature the old is dead it's nailed to the cross all right we have a newness of life that the Lord gives us if you really repent and you turn from that lifestyle you turn from those vows and you turn unto the Lord that blood that he shed on Calvary will cover that sin praise God for that amen 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 Amen. Let's look at King David. How did because David was Amen. the man, bro? Like whenever you, I love King David on every aspect of anything to do with God. Let's look at how King David pressed into the Lord. Let's go to Psalm forty, and basically it's like the whole psalm. But I really love, and you can tell David's heart to press in here in verse one. In verse one, G, you want to read that? 40 verse oh. 1. Yep. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. There's the time right there. There's the oil right out the gate. He what? He waited patiently on the Lord, right? That's that oil, bro, that we're talking about in uh, Matthew 25 with the virgins. And I, I just love the precedence that David sets here, right? David gives us the secret place. David gives us the oil here where, where the first thing he does, he doesn't ask God. He's not saying anything to God. He's shutting up and he's waiting for the Lord, bro. He's thinking about that first scripture we opened up with, that a holy is his name, right? He's meditating on the holiness of God, that scripture to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's where David's mind is. That's what David's waiting upon. And what happens next? The Lord hears David and inclines mm. to him, right? Ain't that beautiful? Yeah. Yeah, this whole psalm's really anointed. But um, so anyways, that's the time. Um, the last part of pressing in, and we're going to look at this now, is resting in the Lord. Okay? This is very difficult for me. I don't know about you guys. But like resting in the Lord is my mind never stops. My mind's always going, dude. Like I'm just wired that way. So for me to shut that off and, and shut the body down and shut everything down and rest in him is incredibly difficult. Let's go to Hebrews 4.11. Let's see. Uh, Charlie, you want to read that? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11.
You're muted out, bro. Thanks. <clears throat> um, now, okay. Hebrews 4.11. Praise God. Okay. Uh, Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. Okay. The example that he's referencing here is he's talking about the Israelites in the wilderness, right? When we look at the 40 years that the Jews came out of Egypt and wandered through the wilderness to come into the promised land, that's the example that, that the author lays out in chapter 4. So he's saying, let us, let us be diligent to enter that rest, right? How do you be diligent to enter that rest? Pressing in, bro. It's the same thing. We got to take time to put that oil in with the Holy Spirit, bro. That's the diligence. That's resting. But what I really want to get out here is because I struggle with this a lot, man. How do, is there anybody here on this men's group that knows how to rest in the Lord? Like, how do you guys rest in the Lord? The way, well, good the way point, I do yeah. it is, I, I mean, it, it took me a while to master this, too. And I, I don't even like saying mastery of it, but I mean, the, the, the way that because I'm, I'm the same way, like when I was in the world, I was like a shark. I was always hustling. I was always doing something and I never rested. I'd go two, three, four days, no sleep. And, and you know what I mean? But now the way that the Lord has shown me is literally, you know, the scripture that tells us to be anxious for nothing. And no matter what it is, like trying to plan for things, you know, we always we, we're supposed to, you know, make our plans known to the Lord and he will establish our ways. But when we try to do that in our own strength, I think that's when we get taught lessons quite a lot because we can't do anything in our own strength. Even if it's for the kingdom of heaven, we can't. We have to do it in God's strength. We have to wait on him. We have to press in. We have to be in tune with the Holy Spirit. And when we are set on a task, we have to deal with that task, handle it, and then literally just like sit down and focus on something else and literally just rest sometimes. That's why he gave us the Sabbath, you know, that's so important mm -hmm. to take that actual day and, and try to do nothing. And it is very hard. And I don't know the last time I took an actual Sabbath and did absolutely nothing because I'm always, always doing something. You know, but it's it's a mind frame to be in the Lord and be resting. And then like he shuts the body down and, and you're able to just chill, if that makes any type of sense. Yeah, that's good. Are you, you got all resting, bro? Yeah, yeah, yeah. man, man, I, I think that, uh, you know, to stay on this team, you got to fight, you got to struggle and you got to train. I I wish I could say there was an easy or big easy, but I. I uh, I never found the big easy the soft easy path and as far as work uh, my <laughs> opinion is this no one gets to you know no one gets to rest until you work first uh, where <laughs> I come from you know you work before you play so I want to see everybody work and then you get then you deserve the rest but I think as Americans I think we want to rest first and then maybe we'll go work right. That's my thoughts. Craig, what do you uh, got on resting in the Lord, bro? Well, uh, one thought is kind of an opposite approach, but not really. And that is to have confidence in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross for salvation and not be like the Masons who have to build their own stairway to heaven and think they're going right. to get into, into heaven another way, uh, you know, like climb over the fence or whatever. Uh, that we're on the only way we're going to get there is through the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ and through his blood. Uh, there's no way we're going to be able to work our way to heaven. So have confidence and faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for us and then work because we want to work, but not for salvation because the salvation, the price has already been paid. Amen. Amen. That's good. All right. Mike. Um yeah, my thoughts on this are, and I'm still figuring it out, but I was actually thinking about this yesterday night, like last night. 
and how God showed me in my heart, like how much better I was doing. Cause you know, you can, you know, your own progress, like nobody can take that from you. You know, they can try to steal it from you, but I was just thinking about how pissy I used to get, you know, cause like, when things didn't go my way, you know what I mean? And, and like, and he's learned, he's teaching me and I am learning to just, like you said, wait on the Lord. And I was thinking about how just to trust God is resting in him. Just, just don't even worry about mm-hmm. it. Like literally, and you see, the carnal mind is like got me thinking, I gotta, I gotta like conser- cons- be concerned about this, that, and the other. But like that just builds more anxiety and stress, no matter what it is, big or small. And it's like I realized in that moment, I'm like, I felt so peaceful because I had truly just been like, Lord, I, there's nothing I can do about this particular situation. And I feel, and I, he showed me how much peace I had, how much rest I had just from not even worrying about it, but not just not worrying, but not worrying because I know he's got it, but I'm not always strong, but that's what the the goal is. Like, no. And I thought about wrapping it up. I thought about, I need to just put that, apply that to every situation. It doesn't matter what it is. Literally, if I could just be that strong at all times in Christ, like there would be no reason to stress about anything. And I believe that's the rest that he's talking about because rest, he is the Sabbath rest. Mm-hmm. It's like somebody the other day was like, Oh man, you work on Sundays. And I'm just like, well, Sunday ain't even the Sabbath day. It's Friday night to Saturday night. So it's like right there. You're already out of order. So you're going to try that legalistic thing. And it's like, Jesus used that example. It's like, if you had like, like, a, like if you're uh you know, you, your horse got out or whatever, you know what I'm saying? And he's, and he's in a hole or whatever. <laughs> like cheap. You're going to pull it out and rescue it. It's it's some work, but it's like you need that to continue on or whatever the next day. It's not like you wanted to have to work. Or like when Jesus, that's not the best example. Let me let me just use the one they, ha- they, they killed Jesus over, man. He healed a man on the Sabbath. But he was in the Father. He was just obedient. He was trusting his Father. He was led to do that it wasn't on his it wasn't like he was like trying to work on his own power he was in rest he was resting you know what i'm saying he did that wasn't even work for him you know what i'm saying like he wanted to do that thank you jesus he was work. he was heartily like he tells us to work heartily unto the lord so that's to work heartily as unto the lord and not unto men is you're resting even though you're physically working there's a rest how many times not <laughs> one more thing I just drank some coffee before I'm like thinking, but like, check it out. Check it out though. How many times have you had a good day at work? You're in your work zone, bam, you're, you're, you're working harder than probably about anybody else, but, but it's like, you're happy to do it. Like you're heartily working as under the Lord. Like it ain't even, you ain't even getting physically tired. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Yeah. It's all, bro. You know, what was jumping out at me, Mike, the whole time you were talking was submission. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. As long as we're submitted, that's the key to it, man. Being submitted to the Lord and all things are possible, man. We won't get tired. We will be in a perpetual state of rest. Nothing will bother us. There's nothing to be anxious for anyway. The Lord's got it. You know what I mean? It's so hey, beautiful. What is, but, what does Isaiah 40, 31 say? Those that wait upon the Lord shall mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not grow weary, right? Uh, so. Right. There it is, bro. I mean, I felt that. Like, I work at Amazon, and I'm not supposed to be there. I'm supposed to be truck driving, but, like, I, I've been hating it. Every I hate all of it. And, like, my days go by so slow. But, like, after I read the whole, like, work wholeheartedly to the Lord, like, I really try to do that. And now it's like I clock in, and I just clock out. Like, it's that fast. <laughs> and I'm like, thanks, Lord, for a quick day. Today was a good day. I got the tasks I wanted to do, and it, it just works out. So, I mean, I still got to force myself to do that because – I could be jobless. And, Amen. Um, so. And you know, a lot of times in your defense and in, in anybody's defense, if they have a bad day, a lot of times, and I'm working on this too, it's the, it's the people around us and the environment yeah. that they're carrying. And we got to be mindful not to let that, you know, we don't, we're supposed to shift the atmosphere, you know, in Christ. Right. And you got demonic forces working through other people and they, they don't even realize it. It's like, that's just how they normally are. And then if we let that affect us, we can get sucked into that storm that they're going through rather than let them be consumed by the peace of the living God that should be flowing out of us 
You know what I mean? If we're, you know, on fire, I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. Easy to win, but that's the goal though. You know, that's the standard, but just try to keep your eyes, our, our, our eyes on Christ. So we hey, don't man, at work right now, like what made it better is like, I'm at, I'm currently at war with a, a mysterious Satanist and a mis- mysterious Hinduist. Cause like people write on these cardboard bins at work they'll be like hail krishna or like put all these like satanic symbols and i'm just there like scratch 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 jesus this jesus that and i'm like now i'm writing down like whole bible like verses just straight scripture on these things taking the time out so like i mean it's stupid it might sound stupid oh, it's but not, man keep doing they're that, putting the symbology the there like <laughs> they stopped packing me i used to pack people's packages and i would like throw in like bible tracks or like i had a pocket bible on me i'll just like throw it in there and i don't know if they realize what i was doing but like they don't let me pack no more so now i'm out on the machines like <laughs> seeing all this other stuff and i'm like i'll keep going i'll keep doing it hey john <laughs> when you scratch them names out pray in your heart and rebuke that evil spirit while you're doing it oh i do and rebuke its power bro like, I, I might be doing a little too much. Like, it's Halloween season. Like, people are ordering, like, devil costumes. And I'm, like, completely praying over the costumes, like, mid-aisle. Like, I probably look crazy 20 feet in the air, just, like, head down. Like, Lord, I rebuke this. Whoever's home this is going to, may they just encounter your love. And just, like, I'm just. Amen. Bro, Amen, bro. Your back. <laughs> Amen. Hey, let, like... me, let me tell you. Can I tell you a testimony real quick? That's be selfish. Yeah, come so on, I... man. So part of God's favor on my life, this was a previous job I'm not at anymore, but like there was an atheist there and I respected him as a man. Like, dude, other than that, he didn't believe in God. He was a solid man. Like if he, once he came to, would come to Christ, he's going to be a problem, you know, for real. But he was like, we both were talking about it. And he's like, man, he's like, I feel sorry for you. And I was like, I feel sorry for you. And then one day I wrote a, I, cause I had a drinking cup and I wrote, I put a cross on it in my name because that's just what i did you know that was my cup that i drank out of and i just put a cross on it that was where i was at okay and he grabs a cup and he draws like the onk on it and then like all these other um he tries to say this is where your cross came from all these old ancient symbols and i was like i did i was like bro that's that's a deception bro that's a lie like I know, and I tried to go in and tell him about Helena Blavatsky, that old witch, and you know, she put out the zeitgeist movement and all that stuff. It's just a big old deception. And he wasn't hearing that. So what I did, like like uh, Brother Matthew just suggested, pray. Like that's the most powerful thing you have against those symbols is mm-hmm. praying. In that area that they wrote them, just like you do with the down the ho- in the Halloween aisles. You know what I'm saying? Just have a have a little like a like a I want to say an altar there of prayer, but you could and just where people will be kind of turned off by that kind of stuff. But, but that's all I don't get distracted. That dude got it up getting fired like less than two weeks later. I didn't wish it to get fired or nothing, but he was removed. I'm just going to say that. And it was right after he did that. And I was just like, Lord, I I was like, I don't want to have to deal with this anymore. I was like, this dude, I was like, I pray you save his soul. But, and he didn't want to teach me nothing, you know, but like he just removed that man from out of that air, out of that workplace. Well, I feel like with what I got going on, it's like I started something. I'm not trying to take credit for it, but like now I see other people's handwriting talking about Jesus on the same bins, whether it be in a different aisle. So I'm like, okay, we're, I'll leave something Amen. behind. I leave out in a month. That's thank you, Lord. I don't and know if people are scared to do that. Like I walk around with a the was it John fourteen six sticker on the back of my hard hat. So when I'm walking away, anybody behind me is gonna see it. So like you don't like to see it, but you're gonna see it. So awesome, man. Go ahead, Arnie. Go ahead. Okay, here's what I was thinking. Maybe we need to have a new definition of work because I, I find that if you like and if you like what you do. I don't really see it as work. I'm kind of like having fun. And uh also want to close with something that uh, I'd like to close anyway. I know Matthew wants to close. But uh, James no. said, and listen to this last word, what James said. James said, faith without works is dead. Dead is dead, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> anyway, I just had to put that little plug in there for James. Amen, Arnie. All right, let's wrap it up with this, guys. We've covered, as far as pressing in, we've covered our time. We've covered rest. We've covered work. 
Now let's look at the last one, which is persistence. And we're going to close with this last parable. It's Luke 18, verse 1 through 7. The parable of the persistent widow. And uh, let's see, Craig, you want to close it up tonight? Uh, chapter 18, verse 1 through 7. What was that again? Luke, Luke 18, 1 through 7. All right. Luke 18, 1 through 7. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying there was in a city a judge, which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? And he spoke so, this. Parable. Is that it? Okay. There. Yeah, yeah. So, so Jesus gives us this parable to remain persistent. You're going to fail a thousand times. Just keep going, and it's going to click, man. I'm telling you that oil, everything, apply all of it. Um, G, you want to close us out in prayer tonight? Absolutely, absolutely. Father God, we come to you in the mighty name of your Son, Jesus the Christ of Nazareth, and we just give you all thanksgiving, Lord. All praise, all power, prayer, worship, honor, glory, and respect in Jesus' name. And Father, I just want to thank you, Lord, for this time that we got to share tonight, fellowshipping in your word, Lord. I pray that you strengthen every single one of these brothers on this line, Lord, and that you bless them and you set a hedge of thorn of protection around everything that concerns them from their jobs to their families, to their businesses, to everything that they are doing, Lord. May they all grow increasingly and mightily in you, Lord Jesus, for your glory. And may we all burn out the devil and take back territory in Jesus' name. Everywhere we go, may we cause earthquakes in the spirit realm in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That was fire, bro. All right, guys, have a good week. And we'll catch y'all, Lord willing, next week. Thank you, Matthew. Adios. Yeah.